I cannot wait to share this bread of life with you. God is just amazing to me. He just astounds me how he's able to speak to this North Georgia boy and tell me things that just, it's like, wow, God. The message is entitled, Drinking from the Well of Desire. So many people throughout the world and throughout history have chosen in their life to choose to drink from the well of desire. The thing about that well is it will never satisfy you. It will leave you longing. It will leave you hurt. It will leave you broken. It will leave you destitute even. And the enemy comes to exploit our desires. And he uses those desires to work us like his slaves in a promise that we might get a desire fulfilled. But God has given us a word today, a sure word, that is going to break people from drinking from that well of desire. Are you ready for it? Isaiah 55, let's pick it up in verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts. Some people don't even realize they thirst any longer because they have been thirsty so long. You can actually go without food so long that you don't even realize you don't need food any longer because your body is feeding off of itself, malnutrition. Come to the waters, the prophet says, and you who have no money. What did the Lord just say? He is the one that bought everything for us through the precious blood of Jesus. Come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. He says, why are you doing these things that are not satisfying you? Let me show you another way through the Spirit of God, Isaiah speaking. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your what? Your soul shall live. Hear and your soul shall live. Father, in the name of Jesus, I prophesy life is going to go forth in the name of Jesus to the nations of the world, to this house, God. The life, the Zoe power of God is about to be released and unleashed through your anointing because your word is going to go forth like a double-edged sword with fire and with power, and it's going to set the captives free. It's going to heal the brokenhearted, and it's going to call the prodigal sons and daughters back to you. We prophesy life to those dead bones. In the name of Jesus, people have written you off, but God says, I'm still for you. I'm still fighting for you. Come and eat what is good that your soul may live. We declare it over them in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. There are people listening here and watching who are driven by their desires. There is something in them that is searching for significance and meaning for their life. You ever been there? Lord, why did you put me here? I have no significance. Nobody really cares about me. If I were to die, nobody would miss me. And people are looking for significance and meaning in their life today. But everything that they have tried has failed them. We live in a physical world. And we can only experience this realm that we live in through our senses. This is why the kingdoms of this world are built upon sensuality. They want to tantalize your senses. They want to work you up. They put subliminal messages inside of ads. We've known that for a long time, that they do that. Why? They're playing upon our senses. They're stirring up desires inside of us because if you have those desires, you'll want to satisfy them. And they offer you the remedy to that itch. The problem with sensuality, as Isaiah reveals to us by the Spirit of God, it can never satisfy a spiritually thirsty or hungry soul. Desires cannot satisfy your thirsty soul. Consequently, many do not know how to truly be satisfied in their souls. And it shows up in their everyday life. They're unsatisfied. They're miserable. And they can cause other people to be miserable around them. Don't raise your hand. When someone attempts to find the fulfillment that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus, 
but they seek their fulfillment through the pleasures of sin and of this world, they will experience one failure after the next. No one can be God to us but God. No thing can be God to us but God. God said, I'll have no other gods before me. Every human enters this world with a God-shaped void within them. Every one of us did. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It's how we go about trying to fill that void that will either lead us to a life of shambles and regrets or a life of peace and contentment. Turn with me to Genesis 3 and let's go back and see how Eve handled her life. Verse 1, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said? That's what Satan does best, cast doubt in your mind about God, his character, his integrity, and his faithfulness. And that's what he's doing here by attacking God's word. That's how Satan robs us of God's blessings. He attacks God's word. Has God indeed said? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Now he's contradicting God. The world is diametrically opposed to God because it's led by the spirit of Antichrist. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Or King James says, as gods, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw, do you see that? She saw. That's senses. She started relying on her senses, did she not? He stirred up her desires, and she's operating not out of her spirit, not out of her heart. She's operating out of her senses, y'all. She saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. There's that feeling, pleasant, a tree desirable. To make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate, gave to her husband, and he ate. As you will learn in this message today, we don't really know truth until we know it by the Spirit. We do not know truth until we know the truth by the Spirit. Simon Peter is with Jesus and the other disciples when Jesus comes to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus sits there with his disciples and he says, Who do men say that I am? And then he turned to his disciples and he says, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, before his mind could even think, the Spirit of God spoke through him and says, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. God's Spirit revealed that to him because Jesus said, Flesh and blood did not make this known to you, but the Father in heaven has made this known to you. You do not know the truth until the Spirit of God reveals it to you, who is the Spirit of truth. Until truth is revealed to us by the Spirit of God, we will only think we know the truth. Here's how you can tell, gauge yourself, whether you know the truth or you really think you know the truth. If you really know the truth, you will have a confidence that hell cannot put out. If you think you know the truth, you'll shy at every little thing that intimidates you about your God and your faith. See, sometimes we think we know the truth until it's revealed to us, but such has been the case concerning something I have taught about Eve over the years. Because the serpent told Eve that she would be like God or King James as gods, plural, I wrongly assumed since Eve acted on the serpent's mention of God or gods that she ate of the tree of knowledge because she had a desire to be like God. I was wrong in teaching that way. God opened it up to me and says, I'm going to reveal something to you by the Spirit, not out of your assumptions. Plain and simple. If Eve truly had a desire to be like God, she would have gone to God herself, would she not? You don't go to the world to get to know God. You don't go to a prostitute in order to get to know your wife. Who goes to the enemy to be like God? Somebody who is deceived, and Eve was deceived. So what was it that she was after, y'all? She didn't have a desire to be like God. She didn't, but she wanted to know things 
the way that God knows them apart from God. Paradigm shift. See, when God says you're getting closer to things and I've got to take the tradition out of you, the assumptions, the opinions out of you that you thought, I allowed it for a season and a reason, but now I'm showing you the truth. And when you know the truth and operate it, that truth will make you free. So I thank God that he's developing me and changing me so that I can speak the unadulterated truth to people that have a heart and an ear to hear it and receive it so that you can stand on that truth so the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against you. Can I get a witness in this house? She wanted to know things the way that God knows them, but to do it apart from God. And we do that very same thing. I want to be like God, but I don't want to be accountable to God. I want what I want. This tells us that there is something innate, something born in us as humans that desires to experience life in the pleasures of this world apart from God, and it won't ever happen. You cannot find life in the world. You cannot find life in sin. You can't find it in drugs, alcohol, sex. You can't find it in anything of the world. There is no life. There is only death. Oh, yeah, I know. When you eat of it, you will not surely die. You'll have life like you've never known it before. What did she have, y'all? Death. Instead of life, we will only produce and partake of death, loss, regret, and anguish like Eve did, thinking we're going to have life. John chapter 4. Let's go deeper. John 4, 13. Jesus has come. He said, I must needs to go to Samaria. And there he went to the well of Jacob. And a Samaritan woman comes there. It's lunch hour. The disciples and everybody is gone probably to have lunch. And it's just the woman and Jesus. And so Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. And it says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will what? You're going to thirst again. You're going to come back here again. You're going to have a cyclical life. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? There's things you've gotten in bondage to, you've sold your soul to, and you thought, I'll never thirst again, and that's all you do. Now you've got the bondage and the thirst. You took a hard situation and you compounded it. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And when the woman heard this, she said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now it's interesting that she says that I may not thirst, but then she added that I do not come here to draw. What was it in her life that she wanted to be free from so that she wouldn't have to go to the well when nobody else was there? Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Now Jesus is getting to the root of her problem, is he not? And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said. I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you have spoken truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You just told me my life story. Jesus told the woman that whoever drunk of Jacob's well, they would continue thirsting. It would not satisfy them. But whoever drinks of the living water that Jesus shall give them, they will never thirst again. Isn't that awesome? You'll never thirst of the things of this world ever again. In him you move and live and have your being. He shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Simon Peter, after the crowd at Capernaum walked away from Jesus, and Jesus looked at Simon and the disciples and says, Are y'all going to leave me also? And, G and Simon looks at him and says, Where shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. We've already been out there. We've done that, got the T-shirt. We know nothing is out there. When you meet someone for the first time, like Jesus met this Samaritan woman, you probably won't know how spiritually parched 
their souls are or how broken their lives are. Jesus didn't allow their cultural differences to keep him from ministering to this woman's deepest needs. The Samaritan woman, prior to where we started reading, says, how are you, being a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan woman? We have no dealings with each other. And Jesus just totally disregarded that. She had been drawing from the well of desire, and it kept causing her pain, brokenness, and lost relationships with five husbands. Cyclical. Repeating the mistakes of the past because she was drawing from the well of desire. She was seeking for something in a relationship with man that she could only find in a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. That's it. Faith. Whenever a husband and or a wife, hear what the Spirit is saying, seeks to draw life from the well of desire of their spouse, they will place heavy burdens on their spouse that could eventually break down the marriage because your spouse is not, nor can they ever be, who only Jesus can be to you. And people destroy their own relationships, their own marriages, trying to make their spouse God to them. And it drains them of the life. It wears them out. They're tired all the time because of the fatigue of being pulled on. Another pitfall to making the well of desire, mistaking it for the well of life in a person. Many will take advantage of your need and rule over you. Instead of giving you what you desire of them, they will only take from you. Jesus is not that way. How many has ever been used? You had a desire, and you saw someone that says, they can feel that desire for me. And so you got in a relationship, whether it was a partnership, a friendship, or a relationship. You joined with them because you thought they could answer that need. And they, all the while, they picking up on your need, but they're not going to give it to you because they're going to want something from you first. Check it out. And they drag you along. They string you along. How many is having that done to you right now? Don't raise your hand. See, God is equipping us today. When you drink from the well of desire, people will string you along. They'll take advantage of you. They'll pick up on that neediness inside of you, and they will exploit for their own benefit. And after you have been broke, busted, and disgusted, and fed up with how they treated you, you'll walk away from them, but you'll walk away knowing that you entered in that relationship because it was wrong to begin with. You still love me. Luke 15. Let's take it deeper. Verse 11. Jesus is speaking. He says, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided his livelihood, and his son left the house with the money. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, trying to get as far away from his daddy and them as he could, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. That's a picture of leaving the Father's house to go for a desire in the world. It will take everything that you have been blessed with in the Father's house. It will take it away from you, and then it will put you into a severe famine because God is not feeding you any longer. It's the world that you're feeding off. In order to get help, he went and joined himself to a citizen. Is he needy? Absolutely, he's needy. So he goes and connects himself. There's that relationship. It's wrong because it's out of a well of desire of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. He's using him. He's exploiting him, y'all. How do I know that? Read on. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Why did he allow that citizen to send him into the field to feed the swine if he wasn't giving him anything? 
That's how destitute, that's how desperate people get when they're drinking from the well of desire, but they don't want to give place to repentance or brokenness and allow it to turn their hearts back to God. They become spiritually, emotionally, physically, and relationally bankrupt, and no one will give you anything. But the good thing about this is he had a heart. It was buried up under all that desire, but he had a heart. How do you know that? Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's what the well of desire drinking from that will cause you to become unworthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of your love. I'm not worthy of your goodness. And people in North Georgia live under this. I get it constantly. I'm nothing. I'm not worthy. The world does that to you. God does not do that to you. God didn't forsake you. You forsook God. I can't get what I want from you, God, so I'm going to go find it in the world. Let me know how that works out for you. Matthew 11. Living by desires alone will plunge you into desperation, hopelessness, and feelings of unworthiness. Why do you think suicide is so rampant right now? Because the world is not satisfying people any longer. And people become unable to be loved because sin, Satan, and the world has ravaged them who are driven solely by their desires. Just as this young man was reduced to eating the husk of corn, y'all. Not the corn, the shuck, the husk that you feed pigs. That's what he began eating. He had become a shell of a person like that husk that he was eating. You will eat what you become. Stripped of any self-worth, stripped of any self-dignity, and stripped of self-respect. That's what the world will do to you. And then you will live with the reproach of your decision. It's like after Satan has seduced you, lured you into that relationship with he and the world, and he strips you of absolutely everything, he jumps on top of that and starts condemning you to hell. You worthless piece of trash. Condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh but walk after the Spirit. Because the Spirit of Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Now, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Let's take and turn a corner here. We've talked about how bad it can be when we live off the well of desire. And Jesus gives an open invitation to whosoever will. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What did the citizen of that far country do to this prodigal son? He used him in the fields. He worked him like a slave. What did Pharaoh do to the Jews in Egypt right before God delivered them out of Egypt? He turned them into his personal slaves to build his cities. And Jesus comes, says, have you had enough? Come to me. All you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Take his yoke. And learn of me. That's what we have to do. That's why discipleship is so key in church bodies, is that we've got to learn of him. It's not just coming to him. You've got to learn from him. For he is gentle. People are so used to having a master lord over them, they don't understand what it's like to have a, a lord that loves you. Will you do to me what they have done to me also? Jesus says, no. I am gentle. I am lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that. I love praying with people that come in here. They're so heavy and weighted down. And you counsel and you pray with them and they get delivered. And that weight just falls off and their countenance just changes 
the wrinkles. God renews our youth. You know how he does that? Through the anointing. He takes that stress off, and your skin goes back to pretty. The world is filled with broken people who have shattered lives. It's full of people that have shattered lives, but many still refuse to turn to Jesus because of this. They have preconceived ideas and notions that both Satan and the world have sown into the heart about who God is and about how bad he is. So they're broke, they're shattered, they're a shell of a person, but they still refuse to turn to Christ because they're believing the wrong report. Why does the world want to listen to the world about God when they hate God? Why won't they listen to God? Why won't they come to church? They're doing the exact same thing that Eve did. She went to the serpent to find out how to get like God. People listen to the world to get their news about who God is. How blind is that? It's really blind. And then they'll have the audacity. I'm going to get down there where we live. To come to you when you've been in church, you've been saved, you've been reading the Word of God, you know God's ways, and they'll come to you and start arguing to you that God is not who we say He is, and He will not do for them what He's done for us, and they'll argue with you in your face. Can I get a witness? Don't let them shame you. A good friend in the ministry told me this many years ago, that a person with a testimony is never at the mercy with someone with an argument. You're too late. I've already experienced God. I've experienced His goodness. I cannot deny that I have experienced Him. He is the best Lord I have ever had. He is a friend that has stuck with me when everything else left me. He was right there with me. Don't come in here with your argument that God is not good. God is good. He is great, and He's greatly to be praised. He's a present help in a time of trouble. He is the only one that can step in when everybody else has stepped out. He's the only one that can heal me. He's the only one that can put the pieces back together in my life he is the only one that has proven himself faithful to me and my family don't tell me God ain't good that's how you overcome Satan with your testimony somebody needs to get some boldness in your life and start telling the world let me tell you let me brag on my God for a minute I didn't go to hell because he went to hell for me I didn't go to the cross because he went to the cross for me he did not condemn me he saved me have you ever attempted to share faith in Christ with people and they turn the deaf ear on you even though you knew their life was just broken? If you have a burden for someone who fits that description, you need to begin praying continually for them that God would cause them, get this, cause them to develop a hunger and a thirst in them for him. He, the prodigal, began to want. He began to lack. So now... He's drinking from the well of desire. His desires are not fulfilling him. And now he's empty. He's empty morally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and relationally. He left the only ones that ever loved him. And so they get hungry. They start searching. Well, I've tried satanic worship, I've tried drugs. I've tried witchcraft. I've even tried religion. None of that will satisfy. And so they'll start getting a hunger. They don't realize what that hunger is. It's a hunger for God that's coming up inside of them. There's a place that you can get that is so low, you'll start tapping into hunger. And I ain't talking about hunger for anything in this natural world. I'm talking about the kind of hunger that once it tastes the living water, there is something that connects with them on every level of their being that says, I will never, ever go back because I have tasted everything. I've done everything. You can't tell me anything I haven't done that I haven't done, and I want Jesus. And they will not. They will. You talking about the body of Christ 
when these guys that's out here in the world living it up think they got it going on and Satan bankrupts them and they start developing that hunger, there is going to be a revival that will set this place on fire. So we need to start praying for that hunger to develop in them. Matthew 5 verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountain. And when he had seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Everything that you lack, you're blessed because you're about to get. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be, not might be, not could be, you shall be filled. When you're filled with God, you won't desire anything of the world. It just won't happen. If there's ever been a time that the church needs to be true salt and true light to the world, it's right now. Light, the kind of God light, will draw those who are lost in the sea of life safely to the Lord. Let your light shine, y'all. Quit acting like you got one foot in the world and one foot in God, and you only pull out the God side whenever you got problems. Can I get a witness? They see your double-mindedness, and they'll have no respect for you. I'm sorry if that offends you, but the truth has got to go forth. We cannot be double-minded. We cannot vacillate. We can't be fleshly and worldly on Monday through Saturday and act like we feel with the Holy Ghost and fire on Sunday morning. People know somebody when they are chameleon. Salt will cause the lost and hurting to want to partake of spiritual food and living water so that their thirst and hunger can truly and finally be quenched. Too many Christians are trying to avoid offending people. We're just obsessed with it because the world taught us that. You know who taught us that? The world. And it came into the church. And now pastors are doing easy listening music. We don't want to offend. We get the sermons 28 minutes. Got to get them out. Don't want to offend them. Don't want to use up their time. We got that from the world. We did not get that from God, y'all. We need to get the world out of the church. Can I get a witness? Instead of worrying about offending people, what we really need to do is allow them to see Jesus living through us. Jesus doesn't offend the broken. He sat with the publicans and the sinners, the tax collectors. He sat with them, and they were not offended by his presence. He went in where a Pharisee was, and he was totally offended by him. Jesus does not offend the broken, but he does offend the religious. To the sinner, truth saves. To the religious, truth exposes their hypocrisy. Psalm 34. So what do you do? He says, come to me. Those who hunger and thirst shall be filled. Let every truth be established in the mouths of two or three witnesses. Here's another witness. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What would have happened if Eve would have eaten of the tree of life first? The tree of knowledge would have had no place in her life because she would have received life. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts, put their trust and faith in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Here it comes. There is no want to those who fear him. I fear the Lord. I fear him greatly. But there is a benefit that I am after because I fear him. There is no want in those who fear him. And so if I have any want, I go to God. I say, God, I got these wants. And you got to help me with these wants because your Bible says you will withhold no good thing from those that walk upright before you. And there will be no want in those who fear you. So let's take care of that want, okay? And he does it. Eve had to partake of the tree of knowledge. She had to partake, eat. The Bible said she ate. She had to partake of it before she could know and experience what the serpent promised to see if what he promised would actually come to pass and occur in her life. It's interesting that folks will jump at the chance to risk it all, to partake of sin, but then turn a deaf ear when they are promised life and peace in a relationship with Jesus. 
Isn't that interesting? They'll risk all. They'll break their neck to try something new that the world has. They stand at line overnight for a new cell phone. How many does that at church? Raise your hand. I want y'all to start getting here at midnight next Saturday. There won't be enough room in here for y'all. You got to get it while the getting's good. No. Might get here at 1045. 11. 1130. Woo, got quiet. They risk it all, y'all. Is God painting a very clear picture for us this morning? They'll risk their entire soul, their life, everything, their family for their sin's desire. And then turn around and turn a deaf ear to the promise of life, peace, and joy. Jesus said, what does it profit a person if they were to gain the entire world? I want you to imagine somebody signs the deed of the entire world over to you. And you tell them in exchange for this, they say, you've got to give us your soul. Jesus said, that's what will happen if you were to gain the whole world and lose your soul. It will profit you nothing. This will show you how effective Satan, the God of this world, is at blinding people spiritually so that they're only willing to trust their senses and their desires when they run the risk of losing their souls. The only thing we stand to lose, the only thing Christians stand to lose Accepting eternal life through a relationship with Jesus is our sin, our shame, our regrets, our mistakes, our pain. You run the risk of losing that. Isn't that awesome? Sinners, on the other hand, who reject Jesus have everything to lose for all of eternity. And Christians who are sold out to Jesus have absolutely everything to gain for eternity. Wow. Turn with me to John chapter 1. We're done. John 1, 1. In Genesis 1, God looked on the earth that he had created. And you know when God creates, there's two elements that will always exist. Life and light. God does not work in darkness. He is not. As a matter of fact, there's no shadow. Because he radiates light. There's no variableness. There's no changing with God. He's truth. He's absolute truth. He's righteous. He's holy. There's no spot or blemish in his being at all. And he looks on his earth, his creation, in Genesis 1, and it says it was dark. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and it was void. Void. That sounds like a person, like the prodigal son. They're in darkness And they're void of anything of life. Any semblance of God, they're void of that. And so God says, let there be light. you got to turn on the light to let the roaches know you're here. And then he set boundaries. And when he set boundaries, it allowed, listen, God sets boundaries in our lives. That's what he's doing right now. He's setting boundaries in your life because you got to have some things separated from you. Divide the waters from the waters. Let the land be divided. Let there be water and let there be land. There's got to be some division that's going on. What is God doing? Is he trying to kill us by separating us from the things that we used to love or maybe even still love? No. He's trying to sanctify, set us apart so that we can become conduits and vessels that his life can dwell in and flow out of. That life may go out into the world. John 1.1, we're done. In the beginning was the Word. Isn't it interesting how Genesis 1, Moses starts it the same way that John does. But the difference is, Genesis is the natural account, and John is the spiritual account. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And in Him was what? In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness cannot extinguish it. So as God said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. The sun was not created until day four. He let spiritual light come into the atmosphere of earth and push back the evil and the darkness. And in John 1, God sent Jesus who is the light of the world. And he sent him into the world to redeem and to restore fallen man from death and spiritual darkness. You can choose to live your life based on desire only. 
Or you can choose to accept the life of Jesus in your heart and live a life of peace and contentment with blessing that has no sorrow. It's up to you. You're the one who chooses what you eat or partake of. God bless you all. Thank you all.